where my heart aches can find. And the midnight sky is a diamond veil on an open bed. There's nothing I own and nothing that I like. Well, from National Public Radio News in Washington, I'm Carl Castle. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Not bad for a newscaster, huh? All right. Well, the, the guys are a little late. The car guys, uh, they're a little late tonight, so they asked me to come out and kind of fill in. You don't suppose they're having car trouble, do you? Could be. Anyhow, how many people listen to Morning Edition? Okay. Well, you know that I do the newscast on Morning Edition, and my first one is at 5 o'clock. So to kind of fill you in on what happens, I have to get in between 2 and 2.30 in the morning at the office. Ooh. Uh-huh. Which means I get up earlier than that to make it in. I get up, uh, I set the alarm at 5 minutes after 1 o'clock. I would set it at one, but that's too damn early, don't you think? <laughs> Anyhow, that's the way it is uh, early in the morning with me. But uh, the folks, the on-air people at uh, NPR asked me to come in tonight and do a little spying and find out what it is with these guys with so little talent. How... Uh-oh, I think they're arriving now. Ladies and gentlemen, after 10 years of bad car advice, welcome Tom and Ray Maliazzi. One, two, three. what we're supposed to do but fortunately our producer Doug Berman is sitting right here and he will be guiding us through the night and he's got, hasn't got a clue either <laughs> you know through the, through the magic of uh, satellite communication this show is being broadcast evidently to dozens of NPR stations all around the country and assuming the satellite doesn't spin out of orbit It'll get there, otherwise it may wind up being broadcast to, like, Uranus. <laughs> Bad choice of planets, huh? <laughs> Neptune? Hey. <laughs> hey, guys. Oh, Carl wants us. Wait a minute, I thought you wanted to thank everybody. I, I want to personally thank everyone. Can we start two lines, one over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, sorry, man. All right. What's your secret? Is it... It couldn't be talent. Wardrobe. Is it luck? Wardrobe. Wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, I just want you to know that my mechanic back in Virginia, he wants you to know that he listens to you every week. Uh oh And he says, you know, those guys know what they're talking about. Some of the time. So, well, <laughs> that's more than he can say about the news. <laughs> Wide open <laughs> <for that. laughs> well, listen, uh, before we get into the festivities tonight, uh, I've got a challenge for you. Now, we've heard you guys dispense car advice over the years, telling us how to fix our cars, uh -huh. what's wrong with them, and uh -huh. so forth. We want to know exactly... Do you really know what you're talking about? Because nobody's ever seen these guys work on a car, have you? No, I haven't Not either. really, no. So, we have uh, a car, uh, you're leaning against the car. My wife Tom. saw me work on my Fiat just two hours ago. Really? 
Yes. Is that why you got That's your That's why we took a cab. What? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. Nissan Bombs Junkyard put Auto together, recycling brought in this car, <laughs> yeah. and they fixed it to the point it won't run. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, the key's in the car, and we're going to let you guys go to it and see how fast you can get the car running. Okay? Uh -huh. I have a stopwatch. Okay. I'll turn so, the key. You wait, do the wait, hard part. Hold, hold uh, on. Wait. When I bought my Fiat, yes. my dear mother, my sainted mother. <laughs> Good start, guys. <laughs> <laughs> my sainted mother said the first thing you have to buy is a cellular phone. So do we have hey, a by the way, mom called me today. Yeah. And, and she called me to, to wish me luck, tell me to have a good time. And to make sure that the crease in my tuxedo. What did you have, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> Whoa. Oh. We haven't even touched it yet. <laughs> Get busy. <laughs> I'm going to turn the key. No. Nothing. Yeah? So your well, mother called you. She said, you know, make sure, uh-huh, make sure, what? <laughs> make sure the uh, crease in your tuxedo pants is nice and straight. Yeah. And basically, you know, just have a good time and, and uh, did she call you? She called me, you know what, what she said to me? No. Don't be a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> so how did we do? <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, I okay, wait. Don't, don't, no, watch out. I'll open the hood. Don't. Where's the engine? <laughs> Keep going. I'll give you 2,000 bucks, not a penny more. <laughs> oh. Ah, uh, I see the problem. I see it too. Here it is, man. <laughs> time's up, time's up. <laughs> We'll be back. They certainly don't sound like anything we've done before. They're boorish, vulgar, sophomoric, insulting. They can barely speak English. They seem to spend half their waking hours laughing at their own jokes. But if it'll save me a few bucks on these damn fiat repairs, I guess we can give them their own show. Douglas Bennett, president of National Public Radio, August 6th, 1987. That was the fateful decision. But the radio story begins 10 years earlier. Jimmy Carter had taken office earlier that year, having been elected by a small margin over President Ford by an electorate eager to put the divisiveness of Watergate behind it. It was still the age of the lumbering Chevy Impala, the Ford LTD. Chrysler had just retired the venerable Dodge Dart and was proudly touting its stylish new Aspen. Few people in America in 1977 had heard of catalytic converters or electronic fuel injection and fewer still had heard of two young brothers struggling to make it in the car repair business in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By all accounts, it was a struggling business. I mean, they had some natural talent, but that's certainly not the same as experience, and so, so they made plenty of mistakes. Occasionally, you'd see one of them running down the street after a customer waving some part they forgot to reattach, and they'd be saying, hey, wait, you know, come back, you lug nuts. Dear Secretary of Consumer Affairs, I am writing to complain about my experience at the repair shop of one Tom and Ray Magliozzi in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I went in to get a tune-up for my 1972 Chevrolet Vega. I paid for the work. I left the shop and hadn't driven 10 miles when the car completely died on me. I called the brothers from the nearest payphone, told them what had happened. They repeated the story back to me. It went 10 miles and then broke down? Yes, I said. 
That's great, one of them said. We were afraid you'd break down closer to the shop and come back. I did not at all appreciate the levity with which they treated my situation and fully expect that you will take action against these vulgar brothers. Martha Cleminger, September 14th, 1977. Dear Charmin Ray Magliazzi, I think you need to practice your customer relations skills. I did not appreciate the answer you gave me to my serious inquiry of the other day. I wanted to know what should be done about my 67 dots and that won't start when the temperature is below 50 degrees. I don't think parking it on the street and letting the homeless sleep in it is a well thought out option. Sincerely, your former customer, E.F. Dumont, Belmont, Mass. While the brothers were struggling to achieve credibility in their corner of Cambridge, across the murky Charles River was another struggling enterprise. On the top floor of a dilapidated building stood a little listened to university-owned radio station called WBUR. When you think of WBUR, you think of a powerhouse station that everybody in the city is listening to. But in the mid-1970s, that wasn't really the situation. The university didn't really care what went on the air, and so WBUR had the uh, gay hour, the prisoner hour, the anarchist hour, and of course the gay anarchist prisoner hour. They had a We got a call one day from a guy named uh, Vic Wheatman. And he was the program manager at the time, and I guess he was responsible for booking BUR's regular Saturday morning talk show. And he thought it would be neat to have like six area mechanics on the show to discuss car repair. And we figured it would be good for business. Couldn't hurt, right? Yeah, my brother was busy that day. He was teaching his women's yoga class. <laughs> and working with Lexan. <laughs> so he sends me to go. I go there with Vic, and I'm the only one of the six mechanics who shows up. So for 15 minutes, I tell him everything I know about cars, and then I say, can we, like, ask for phone calls? He gives out the phone number, and the phone's been ringing ever since. Can you figure it? Mr. Wheatman apparently liked what he heard. And of course, you have to ask, compared to what? I mean, he was having trouble filling up airtime in those days, so it was either give the hour to this guy or give it to people for the, for the ethical treatment of cat litter. And, so he asked Tom if he would come back next week, and Tom said, sure, can I bring my brother? And that's how the show got started. But before the Maliazzi brothers ever set foot in that studio together, one more momentous event was to transpire that was to forever set the tone for the program. During that intervening week, Victor Wheatman, the program manager, was fired. Dear Tom and Ray, it's with a heavy heart that I must inform you of my sudden termination. Since I see nothing of my hiring you two in the press, I'll assume that the two events are unrelated, though I remain suspicious. I will leave you with only two pieces of advice. Show up on time and try to watch your language. Best regards, Vic Wheatman, September 30th, 1977. I think that's where things went terribly, irretrievably wrong. The lack of any kind of professional supervision from the get-go was the reason all subsequent attempts to discipline them failed. It's a good lesson for anyone raising children these days. <laughs> We have a couple of friends that uh, you probably know them as auto mechanics. You probably know them real well as auto mechanics, but they really are bluegrass musicians at heart. So we would like to rescue them from a life of fixing cars. Let them pick a little music. Please welcome Tom and Ray Maliazzi on the guitar and the bass. All right, we should, before we, we should tune up, huh, before we, can, can I have like an E or something? <laughs> That's good. In, in keeping with our policy of complete honesty, we advertise this show as being unencumbered by the rehearsal process. I mean, we're trying to live up <laughs> to that promise. And but you I will have, see. We, I have to tell you that we were here for an hour and a half this afternoon and we rehearsed this very song that we're about to play for the second time in our lives <laughs> in keeping with the and also i have to tell you 
I can't remember what the name of it is. <laughs> uh, this song is called The Old Home Place. It's a real bluegrass song. It's about a guy who loses his girlfriend, loses his livelihood, loses everything. Basically winds up a miserable wreck of a man, but it's a really nice song. <laughs> yeah. We're ready. All right. Oh. I fell in love with a girl from the town I thought that she would be true I went away to Charlottesville And worked in a sawmill or two What have they done to the old home place? Why did they tear it down? And why did I leave her now in the fields And look for a job in the town? I lost my love and I lost my home And now I wish that I was dead What have they done to the old home place? Why did they tear it down? And why did I leave the now in the field And look for a job? in the field and look for a job in the town. Because it wouldn't start. <laughs> there you go. Now we'd like to play our second number in our repertoire. And I can't remember the name of that one either. This is about a guy that's too fond of his moonshine whiskey. It's in A. In A. Oh, in A. We do everything in A. Yeah, you're going to kick it off? Uh, a is like the it? first letter of the alphabet, and until you get the first one right, you have no right to go on to the others. Oh. 
And now, the Flying Karamazov Brothers. And welcome to the Flying Karamazov Brothers portion of tonight's program. The music you've just heard was music played as we all know and love it. An auditory confection, listened to and appreciated by you, the audience. An auditory confection. A bonbon for your eardrums. Coco for the cochlea. <laughs> Arugula for your auricula. <laughs> A steaming strudel for your semicircular canals. A glistening. Glutinous globule. For your tremorous. Titillated. Tintinabulating. Tympanic membrane. membrane. Gentlemen, please fail to interrupt. Ooh, thank you. Music, until now, has been the fine art which appropriates the phenomena of sound to the purposes of poetry. But ah, my dear audience, the past masters of harmony have overlooked one crucial aspect of this fine art. Making a living at it. That too, Smedjikov. Over the centuries, music has undergone a progression. From the simple sounds of a shepherd's flute, to the symphonies of Mozart, to the dissonance of the second Viennese school. But it has reached a dead end. Serious modern music, in its explorations of rhythm and harmony, has gone beyond the pale. Pale, from the ancient Greek for ancient paleos, as in paleontology. Oh, doesn't Tom Cruise give money to them? That's right, and so does Bette Midler. A nice Jewish girl like her. A and Lisa Marie Presley. A nice Jewish girl like her. And John Travolta. A nice Jewish girl like her. Music has not made a quantum leap in a thousand years. That is, until, until now. We say music is not only the sensation of sound, but the delight of sight. Hearing is understanding, but seeing is believing. And yeah. rhythm can be seen. We are the bold navigators into the uncharted yet enchanted waters of the next musical wave. Visual music. The music of the 21st century. is a series of events, throws and catches, happening with respect to time. Music, similarly, is a series of events, notes as graphed against a continuum of time. Now this relationship between time and events in music is called rhythm. That same term, rhythm, can also be applied to the same relationship in juggling. So, as we've just seen, juggling is rhythm, and music is rhythm. Now, logic tells us that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, therefore, juggling is music. Yay! You see, I didn't go to college for nothing. Cost me thousands of dollars. You too. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Flying Karamazov Brothers take great pride and pleasure in presenting, for your edification, their suite in three movements for diverse juggling instruments. And now, the first movement, con brio, which in Spanish means with scouring pads.
Bogey. And now, the second movement, con moto, which in Italian means with motorcycles. And finally, the third movement, Allegro, which in English means the Rockettes. It's time now for the Dr. Joyce Brothers Show. She ain't heavy. She's Joyce Brothers. Welcome my guests, who really do need a psychologist. I've been through their minds and it's very lonely in there. So let's welcome my special guests, the Malyazzi brothers, Tom and Ray. Thank you. It's been working out. Yes, I can take you two out of three. 
This is a man who gets winded when he plays chess. I can get him. <laughs> No. So, what do you want to talk about? As soon as I told people that I was going to be working with you, the one question everybody asks Pop is... Point? Thank you, no. <laughs> <laughs> they all want to know, what are you two really like? So, tonight we're going to find out. Oh, God, these, these guys are, were such terrible kids that their mother told me told me that she never gave them their full allowance. She always held something back to bail them out. Now cut it out with the popcorn. <laughs> now. My mother tells me that I was the sweetest child. In fact, just today, mm -hmm. I have a grandson named Benjamin. Uh -huh. He's like a week old or something. And he's such a sweet... He's three. He's three. <laughs> he's three. <laughs> He's little, you know. Very little. Very little. Well, he can't drive yet, so it really doesn't count, you know. I was talking to my mother on the phone today, and, and she said, did you see Benjamin? I said, yeah. I said, he's such a sweet little guy, such a mellow kid. Mm -hmm. And she said, you would just like that when you were a kid. She tells me wait, the wait, same wait, thing, Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, then in the, in the no, same breath, she says, but your sister Lucille, <laughs> she made me crazy. <laughs> But you really, right should be, you, know, you really should be very happy that you have Lucille because the studies really do show that those brothers who have a sister are, when they grow up, are the most content. They are mo more content with their jobs, they're more content with their family relationships, they're more content with their money. Are you content with your money? Well, we don't have any, so it's easy to be content. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> and my brother doesn't have a job, so he's content with a job, I guess. Uh-huh. Oh, you get a microphone and I don't. You know what I have? Well, though? he has a PhD. <laughs> PhD, you're a doctor. Yes, I am a doctor. Uh-huh. Is it you have any pains? <laughs> <laughs> right now <it's> not. <laughs> he has a, a PhD in management, but he told me it was in obstetrics. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you bet you did. <laughs> But really, you, you were sweet kids, both of you? Oh, we were just wonderful. I mean, yeah. you couldn't ask for nicer kids. Yeah. Especially you know, me. Well, which of you is the smartest brother? Uh, you know the truth? Yeah. My brother is. He is, huh? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, know, you know why he is? Well, I, it's hard to know what smarter means. Uh -huh. but. He went to an engineering school and majored in humanities. Uh. <laughs> I actually found the humanities department at MIT. There was none before I got there. Yeah, it was called it's, humanities engineering <laughs> when he was there. <laughs> it, it's like going to the International House of Pancakes and ordering veal parmesan. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but in so doing, uh -huh. he managed to get a much broader education. Yeah, and higher marks. And more dates. He didn't get any oh. marks. The nerds that were oh. studying engineering, they had no time for dates. I, I had see. gals all over the place. You did. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you call them what you want to call them. <laughs> <laughs> Something that moves ain't a gap. <laughs> well, they in, in, my, in my humble opinion. <laughs> Are you really, Joyce, you are you really humble? <laughs> are you really humble? You said in your humble opinion. No, firstborns generally are not you know, humble. It's He's my, not humble. Humility <laughs> is one of the things that makes me great. Ah, oh, I understand. <laughs> yeah. the, the studies done on, on birth order, firstborns are generally much more self-confident. Uh, they get into who's who more. We have more senators who are who's who people. And we also have, who are firstborns, and we also have more strippers. There you go. Uh -huh. Strippers. Strippers. <laughs> strippers. <laughs> strippers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Third, 31 out of 35 strippers have been firstborns. Secondborns. Yes, second, tell me about the secondborns. But you are the, you no, are I'm the, actually the, you're the third. You're the baby of Lucia, the family. Lucia, your secret's out. Yes, yeah. I am the baby you're of the, the family. You're the baby of yes. the family. Now, the he baby was the of mistake. The, the baby of the f <laughs> We didn't want to tell him that. But it had to come out sooner or later. And 
to coin a phrase. <laughs> Mom always liked me better. <laughs> Coolest thing you ever did to your brother? Besides breaking my nose, I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, no, that no, jumped that, right out. That was an accident, though. What? What happened? I've no, never it done wasn't anything. an accident. Let what me explain. Happened? All right, let me explain. I was, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11, and my brother, being 12 years my senior, was 37. <laughs> and, uh, That's the smart one, boy. I like to know what so, you are. So, <laughs> and. We were in the backyard playing catch, and the backyard is about 11 feet long. And he decides that he wants to practice his pitching. So he has me squat like a catcher, and he starts throwing the ball faster and faster, and I start crying and whimpering and asking him to stop, and he keeps telling me to shut up, and he keeps throwing the ball, and finally broke my nose! <laughs> Stupid little shit. <laughs> I mean, why didn't you just go home? You could have gone. I was home. I couldn't go home. Where was I gonna go? Now, now I understand that your sister Lucille, you say, is wacko. Oh. Is she really she wacko? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is she well, I, I think it's probably true, and you, you can bear this out, that every family has one real... <laughs> you know. And fortunately, if she's it, then we've been spared. Uh. Right? <laughs> In fact, my, my father said to me one day, he said, you know, this is a sad thing that I've come to realize. He said, but you, Tom... We're going to make it tonight, dear. <laughs> this is Lucille, my sister. She's yes. also my other sister. <laughs> Lucille, I really feel your pain. How did you survive these guys? <laughs> well, it wasn't easy. Yeah, put a leg up, will you? Yeah, have some pot. Well, actually, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> my sister corroborates the the fact, the story that I was a most wonderful child, and she says the best big brother she ever had. Well, the only big brother. The Shut big up, brother. you little twerp. <laughs> no, I, I, do, I do have to say that yeah. this guy, Yes, go ahead. he scarred me like for life. Scarred you for I? life? Scarred me what for did, life. What did he do to you that scarred you for life? Well, for my birthday, I got a Mickey Mouse watch with a red band. I loved oh, my Mickey Mouse I, I watch. Remember, I remember this. Uh -oh. This jamoke decides he wants to see how the watch runs. Oh, what a flamer. Oh. <laughs> so he takes it apart. Not only does he take it apart, but he puts it back together. And does it run? Well, he has a lot of extra parts when he puts it back this was his early training in auto repair <laughs> he has the because biggest collection of leftover parts of any guy i've ever known well no. we have used up our 50 minute hour and i'm sorry to say that we have to go goodbye <laughs> bye bye all <laughs> <laughs> no! no. <laughs> I'll get you! Dear Mr. Bennett and the National Public Radio Board of Directors, 
I was appalled the other day to hear what passes these days for cultural programming at NPR. The St. Louis Symphony, that's cultural programming. The New York Philharmonic, that's cultural programming. But two undereducated yahoos talking about clutch repair and taking a haircut. Please, Mr. Bennett, cancel this poor excuse for a show at once and return some measure of dignity to this fine institution of ours. Signed, Marilyn Short Broomhandle, General Manager, WUWY, Sandport Springs, Michigan. It was an inauspicious beginning for Car Talk on National Public Radio. The show launched nationally on November 1st, 1987, after 10 years of chasing away listeners in Boston. It was launched to very little fanfare on a handful of small stations and little known markets. Now when they started out, this was a very shoestring operation. It was the two of them and Berman, who we all remember from the subway incident years later. Anyway, they had two rotary phones, and when the show aired someplace outside of Boston, they'd hire student interns to come in and take messages so they could call those listeners back when they're on the air and sound like a national show. Well, they came in to do their second show for NPR, and I guess the interns had gone on a bender and had inadvertently misplaced a week's worth of messages. So they spent the whole show talking to people from Fort Worth, Texas, which, which were the only messages they still had. Yo! You guys suck. I hate your show. You guys are dopes, and I bet you're ugly, too. Get off the air, go back to the idiot farm where you belong. Sincerely, Professor William Dimsdale, Yale University. December 4th, 1987. Uh, P.S. I very much enjoyed Adventures in Atonal Composition on your station last week. Keep up the fine work. Listener reaction was fierce. Protests welled up in various communities to demand that car talk be yanked off the air. It started in the Corn Belt and moved its way westward, kind of like the boll weevil. By spring, there were pickets outside the stations in San Francisco. Busloads of kids were rolling in from Berkeley. Now, you remember this was the late 80s. These were kids who had missed the major free speech movement of the 60s, and they weren't going to miss another major protest movement. It was a remarkable time. Generations were split, and the nation was divided by which side you were on. They said we were vulgar, crude, sophomoric, that we didn't know anything, that we were taking up valuable airtime that could have been better spent on truly meaningful discourse. And we said, yeah, so what's your point? <laughs> Dear President Bennett, we eagerly await your guidance and leadership from National Public Radio. We here at the station have been under siege for days now. Protesters have surrounded our building and refused to stand down. We feel the threat of violence is very near. They are burning our WXYZ tote bags, using our WXYZ coffee mugs as bathroom facilities. And worst of all, I saw one sign among the crowd that says, Met Opera Rules. What have we become, Mr. Bennett? Our staff is frightened, paralyzed, and running dangerously low on Chardonnay. Please advise Daniel Romanowski, professor of broadcasting and general manager, WXYZ Waldenfield, Kentucky, March 15, 1988. It was quickly becoming apparent that the network might not stand. Attentions were at an all-time high. And that's when the Atlanta incident occurred. <laughs> This is the portion of the program. Oh, this is this is the heavy lifting part of the show. For us. For us, yes. Yeah. Because we are we have volunteered to actually take questions from the audience because that's what we good at. There are microphones. Our assistants will pass among you with hats. <laughs> there are microphones scattered around someplace. Maybe there are only maybe there's one. There's a microphone. No, there's a microphone here. And there's another one out in the parking lot. <laughs> there's a microphone here. In case here. you're leaving. That's the only one, right, Dougie? So if anyone has a question about anything, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the Rosenbaum certainty principle, anything about biology, which is one of my strengths. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, already? Hi. Hi. Oh, that's loud. Um, What's your name? Susan. And where are you from? 
Uh, well, I'd like to say Massachusetts, but it's actually New Hampshire. <laughs> I know, you usually make could, fun of people could be from worse. New Hampshire. No, no, we're, we're going to be civil tonight. That's right. It okay. could be Maine. <laughs> well, do you have relatives in Maine? <laughs> I don't, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, so? Okay. So, I have a question um, that my husband's been too um, embarrassed to ask our dealership about. He has a 1995 Eagle Talon. And when you drive forward, everything's fine. But sometimes when you stop the, the guy car... guy right there. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I going to pay for this one. Oh, you're uh, in deep doo-doo. <laughs> so... so. <laughs> Car, and this is sort of intermittent, but sometimes when you back it up, it's as if there's um, a raw egg or a rotten egg smell, or that somebody's done something that you're thinking, who was that? And I'm wondering... My what brother and I experienced this driving in his dart this afternoon, <laughs> rotten egg smell. It was right after we stopped for those sandwiches. Yeah. Those chili yeah. dogs would do it every time. <laughs> And why don't you smell it when you're going forward? Is, is that, that the question? Well, actually, I hope that's I'm the question. What I the hope question so, too. Do we have an answer to that question? No, my question is... So because when you back up, you're going where you were. Oh. And more importantly... <laughs> and as they say, where you were is where it's at. <laughs> Now, the, the deal was, they were supposed to wait until we gave a correct answer, but they, they figured the well, chances were dwindling, you know. <laughs> and one they of them really I know is a plane to catch. They really are from the Museum of Fine Arts School. And, and they are indeed cheerleaders. They are. What's next? We have nine more people standing in line. How many more questions can we take, or is that it? We, 25 more. more. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My name is Rob. What does it say on your t-shirt? Arbor Brewing Company. Ann Arbor, Michigan. But I'm actually from New Hampshire and uh... <laughs> My wife has an 87 uh, Honda Civic and when we don't drive it for about two or three weeks every time we try to start up it makes a horrible howling noise smoke comes from under the hood and the alternator belt bursts in the flames but after I break it loose the alternator works fine what should I do come over to my house and fix my Fiat <laughs> the same doing exactly the same thing wrong with his car. <laughs> you need an alternator the alternator works fine no it doesn't work it fine it drives for a who the hell are you to tell me that the alternator is working fine now, what a yucks! <laughs> now, if wait, wait I, are you asking the question? I'll give the answer. I want to know if I squirt a can of silicone into it. Sure. Will it work? Do whatever you want. What do we can? <laughs> we couldn't care less. Squirt it in the even better. That means good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. This 
this is John Bugsy Lawler. <laughs> and this is the best dressed that Doug Berman has been in years. <laughs> you look great. You look marvelous, Dougie. <laughs> I, just want, I just want you to know, we're going to have these pictures for a very long time. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> You know, that Berman doesn't have bad legs. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Seattle. 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 You brought yeah. the fog with you. That was me. Uh, my wife, Tracy, who I've been married to for two years, day after tomorrow. My wife's name is Tracy, and I've been married okay. to her for two years. Is she short and blonde? What are the chances of that? Yeah, unbelievable. Isn't it? It's like that guy who died of Luke Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig. A, maybe in a kind of <laughs> tangential way. What are the chances of that? 50-50? Yeah, so Mike, what's up? Uh, Tracy drives a 92 Civic. Snap it up, Mike. We're running a tight <laughs> Here I go. We're really, you know. um, she accidentally ripped the cover off the fender the other day uh -huh. and took it into a body shop. Uh, the Honda dealership wanted to charge her four or 500 to put it back on and replace the entire assemblage. And then she yeah. took it to a little shop down the street. And they said they could just slap a couple washers on the other side and do it for 60 bucks. Were they wearing bandanas, these guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Did they look like the Karamont Soft Brothers? <laughs> because Close. these guys do body work when they're not... I mean, you know, sure. how much money could they make doing this? I mean, throwing the You go to around. Natick Mall tomorrow. Whacking They'll be out boxes. there doing paint jobs, taking dents out. Oh, in fact, right now, they're in the parking lot island. doing some what paint jobs in? as we speak. <laughs> some of you will be very surprised when you return to your cars. <laughs> so what's the deal with the price differential? What, uh... what was the question? Yeah. Something about a Honda 60 and... bucks was the better price. Yeah. Of the two prices you gave us... 60 bucks? And I'm going to law school. What the hell? Well, you know, the, the guys at the Honda dealership, I mean, they got the waiting room, the donuts, the coffee, the guys in the white coats and all that. It's not That's worth 300 it. bucks right there. <laughs> <laughs> this is so easy. Piece of cake. <laughs> I love this new format. Yeah. I mean, Do whatever you want. We used to agonize over what to say, what to say. And, and every time we gave a wrong answer, we felt so bad and remorseful. Because we always figured it out, like, after the show was over. We'd say, gee, you know that guy with the, with the, the Saturn on Storo? Oh, gee. We yeah, we should have told him to, to change his oil and his transmission fluid and all that. But, we, and well, but now we don't care. But we don't know. We don't really care. And we'll answer your questions, those of you that are waiting, at our next anniversary show. <laughs> so, hold that question. Thank you. Mr. Bennett, I have never been so insulted in my life. These men are employed by National Public Radio, are they not? And yet you insist upon letting them run hog wild, stirring up a pleasantly sedate listener base with their boorish cavorting. I warn you, Mr. Bennett, the buck may not stop with the two brothers in Boston. The Dvorak-loving masses may rise up and march and may not put down their salad knives until they've stormed the Capitol and installed a new president in the NPR building. Don't say you weren't warned, Mr. Bennett. Yours truly, Rita Zellenweils, station manager, Atlanta, Georgia. These guys went over in Atlanta like, like, a, like a whoopee cushion at a funeral. I mean, and these guys are boorish enough to those of us who speak their language. But, but in the South, in the real South, they came across as know-it-all, self-confident, carpet-bagging Yankees who were much too amused by the sounds of their own voices. And, and rather than step gingerly into enemy territory, well, they, they walked in and said, pull my finger. <laughs> oh, yes, the Atlanta incident. <laughs> well, here's what happened. The station in Atlanta asked us for some promos, you know, some promotional announcements for the show. Yeah. So instead of just doing what he should have been doing, hi, join us for car talk, my crazy brother goes into his best version of the Gone with the Wind theme. <laughs> to make it worse, 
he segues from that into, it's nice to be back among the magnolias, scholars. <laughs> Well, it's true, but I think what really iced it for us <laughs> is when my brother starts his rendition of Butterfly McQueen. <laughs> babies? I don't know nothing about birth no babies. I don't know why, but it just didn't go over that big in Atlanta. I don't know why. <laughs> With fronts opening in the Pacific Northwest, the Great Plains, and the Mid-Atlantic region, it was beginning to look as though the Atlanta incident might be the Tappet brothers' undoing. The folks at NPR were getting very depressed by all this. There was a real sense of despair in the building. People felt like they were under attack from all over the country. And they were. Letters and phone calls were pouring in. There was a real bunker mentality setting in, and spirits in Washington were getting very low. It didn't seem like things could get any worse. And that's when a young producer made a brilliant tactical decision to open up another front. It was the weirdest thing. One minute we were national pariahs. I mean, we were like the Menendez brothers. <laughs> and then all of a sudden everybody was gone. All the protesters went somewhere else. And we found out why. Because yeah. NPR had launched Talk of the Nation <laughs> with that bum, Ray Suarez. <laughs> so I go on the air and... All of a sudden, out of the blue, there are protesters as far as the eye can see. And I'm wondering, you know, where did they all come from? And then I find out. They're car talk protesters. You know, look at this. Coincidence? I don't think so. Dear Mr. Bennett, I have heard some poor programming in my day, but never have I heard anything as boorish and vulgar as that Ray Suarez. Why can't you produce more good quality programming like that nice car talk show you recently introduced? Edwina Farnalader, General Manager and Professor of Broadcasting, WUUUAM, East Armpit, Iowa. P.S. I thoroughly enjoyed your recent exploration of atonal pygmy flute music. Keep up the fire. So all these protesters who were bothering us, they just abandoned us for the sole purpose of getting Suarez off the air. And I don't blame them. I mean, if you heard the guy, it's quite below NPR's high standards in my humble opinion. Oh, my too. <laughs> and so what saved Tom and Ray was that they looked not too bad by comparison. Oh, I think uh, NPR learned an important lesson in all this. If you have a bad program on the air, the best thing to do is immediately put on a worse one. Yeah, it's true. I've been pushing very hard to get Rush Limbaugh his own NPR show. <laughs> what a country. Welcome to the stage, Mother Smother's favorite son, and the other one, the Smother's brother. Cabbage down, boys, turn that old kick round. Own a song I ever did sing, boy, let cabbage down. Hey now, boy, can that cabbage down, turn that old kick round. Only song, Only I, song I sing, boy, let cabbage down. Oh, that was our song. It weren't very long. Come sing along. Seven, six, nine, one, one. Everybody have some fun. This is our song, it's not very long, come sing along. Lolly doo dum diddle dum day, come on Dickie, take it away. <laughs> Hello, 
Whoops, the song is over. That's it. Short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. You are a terrific audience, and we are, we are so pleased. The Smothers Brothers are so pleased to participate in the 10th anniversary of one of my favorite uh, radio shows, Click and Clack. I listen to them everywhere I go. I just love those guys. And to be here for WBUR and NPR Radio and National Public Radio is, is so important that this information be shared and to be in Boston for the Smothers Brothers to be here in Boston and uh, today when I got here we got up there and I'm a pilot and I went over to Hanscom uh, Field there and uh, rented a little Cessna and flew around looking over the boats were out there and, and that's you know, not true a lot of it's true Dick just a second <laughs> just, just let me finish the thought All right. but I thought flying around there, and the, when you fly into the, the when you fly into the big airport and those big planes, you you don't see much. But when you fly in a small plane, and you pilot like I'm flying around with a couple of guys, and and just the bird's eye view of this beautiful city is incredible, and it kind of buzzed you didn't around. You did that. And, yes, I did that. No, you didn't do that. I did it, and uh, and even though I, I've been flying about 10 years now, so I enjoy it. And any time you have a chance to go up in a small plane, do it. It's a I mean, great. You're not a pilot. A you didn't do that. What are you telling everybody? You just, rented an airplane. I'm a pilot. That's not. No, you're not. I'm a pilot. I just anyway, the point is, if you have a chance that you go out and fly around. I know you're not a pilot. I'm Why a, are you claiming to be a pilot? I'm a pilot. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Tom, all you are is a frequent flyer on American Airlines. <laughs> be that as it may, it's not important whether I'm a pilot. I know a lot of you people aren't pilots either. So I just it was just a thought what that what if you are a mean? pilot. It's not a thought. Why is it so important that you're a pilot? It's not important that then I'm Then why did you go to all the effort to make it up? <laughs> Didn't take any effort. <laughs> <laughs> it's not important whether I'm a pilot or not. I mean, a I lot don't of... care how much effort. You're missing the whole point. What's the your... point is you came out here on this celebration, this wonderful night. People, it's a night of love and, and, and celebration. And you come out here and you start trying to mislead the audience about being well, a pilot. It's untrue. If you hadn't said anything, they would have bought it. Yeah, it's not important. So, it's not Doesn't important. that bother you? Why are you kicking a stick with the dead horse? It Let bothers it, me. It bothers me a lot. Let it go. Let's do our song. Let's what get do you out. mean? What's, I would like to do is I do something up here. Okay. But I want to know before we get into our, our song and stuff, that why you had to come out here and lie to these wonderful people. I think people. that's a little harsh. Why don't you, I said I, I'm You're not You're the one pilot. who did it. You lied. But I, I did lie. I retracted it. I, retracted. I called you on it. There's a big difference. You would have let these people go home thinking you're a pilot. <laughs> so what? <laughs> So let's get on with the show. Why are you dragging this out? I want to know why you lied. Why would you say that? Tom, why did you lie? <laughs> National policy. <laughs> now right. well, we are the Smothers Brothers, and we're so happy to be here for, for, for Click and Clack and for the Tappets, and, uh, and to be here, uh, we are the Smothers Brothers. Of course, we're not the original Smothers Brothers. The, they, they passed away in 1969. And why are you applauding? I mean, that's... Terrible plane crash. <laughs> One of them wasn't a pilot. <laughs> He's stuck. That's sick. You guys shouldn't laugh at that. No, we are the Smothers Brothers. We're happy to be here. I'm Tom, and this is Dick, and I was talking with uh, Tom and, and, and Ray, and I say I'm Tom, and this is Dick, because we've been around down here 40 years performing, and a lot of times people, if they see one or the other of us, they invariably get our names next day. They'll call me Dick, or they'll call him Tom, but I'm Tom. I play the guitar. My brother Dick plays the bass, and uh, Dave and, and, and Ray, I was talking with Dave and Ray. I said, you ever get their names mixed up? And they said, a lot of times, Ray will be called Tom, and Tom will be called Ray. And uh, the Everly Brothers, Don and Phil Everly, same thing. They're called Don, Phil, not, and Phil hardly ever gets called Don. Don. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. One time I made a mistake when I said, I, I, one time I, about saying who's Tom, one night, one night I said, I, I'm Tom, I play the guitar, and this is my dick, he plays the bass. I forgot to say. <laughs> That's Would so you stop stupid. that? That was dumb. Well, don't repeat it. <laughs> He actually said that. That once was enough. So I hope you got us straight. Okay? He's Tom, and for tonight's performance, I'll be Richard, and I play the bass. And we like to do uh, a song for you, and that's not it. That's what he does. Had an old dog, had an old dog. His name was Blue. Bitch, $5 is a good dog, too. 
Had an old dog and his name was Blue. Oh, oh, oh. Hey now, you're a good dog too. Are you finished? Nope. Old Jack Frost on the bottom of the dog. Old Jack Frost in the bottom of the dog froze that dog to the ground. Well, he couldn't get up, couldn't get around, but he sure knew how to lay down. Doo -doo. No, 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 silence, stun silence is appropriate. That's a stupid song. Jimmy crack That's corn and I don't care. Jimmy crack corn and I don't care. I don't care. I don't Wait, care. That's, that's not the way that song goes. I don't care. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. Why sing it? I don't know. I don't care. I used to know. Let me think. Let me think. Nope, I don't, don't know. <laughs> You're acting like a stupid fool. <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> yeah. And you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was not a compliment. Okay, what we'd like... Soap, um, soap, 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 soap. Now, what are you doing? Trying to sing about eight bars. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Go on, right now. I told you, you act like a stupid fool. Get off. Go on. I've had it. I mean it. All the way off. Don't just... Go on. Get off. I don't want to see you. Go on. You've milked it enough. Just get off stage. I told him not to do it. Acting like now before the evening is over, I want I want to make sure nobody here leaves with the wrong impression about how Tom and I feel about each other. Because uh, maybe some of you think we hate each other just because we argue all the time. That's not true. I want you to know that we love each other very much. The fact is, we worked out our relationship a long, long time ago. And then again in the dressing room, right before we came out here, we worked it out again. That's the thing you figure out. You got to keep working out. You don't have a relationship. And, uh, God, you know, I, I actually saved my brother's life a number of years ago. And he, he, uh, the only reason I'm saying it is he made me promise that every performance I'd mention it because he's forever grateful, of course. But I got to say I was embarrassed to say that I saved his life because I really didn't do anything special. You know, any one of you, had you been there, you could probably do the same thing. See. All I did was take my foot off his head and pull it out of the toilet. You know? <laughs> That's not a big deal, you know. Any one of you could have done it if your mother was standing right over you and made you do it. So I did it out and he started breathing on his own right away. So yes, you can see why he's so pleased, you know, to be here. You know, actually, and after all these years, we're, we're actually in our 39th year. Next year we'll start our 40th year doing this Mother's Brothers. And uh, thank you. But... They were very kind, but the reason I said that, there's still people that occasionally don't think we're actually brothers. I think it's sort of like the Doobie Brothers or the Righteous Brothers. So if any of you have any doubts, I'd like to officially announce we are natural born brothers. That was not our choice. And uh, it never is. It's not supposed to, is it? Generally, here's how I figured it out. Generally, this is how the family grows. Mom leaves the house one day, comes back with a, with a present. You didn't want, you didn't ask for it, puts it in your room and says, here, honey, it's yours for life. Work it out. And you really don't want to work it out. You'd rather do anything else. But if you're like us, I'm sure like Tom and Ray, you finally figure out that you've been blessed and your parents blessed you with having siblings. And our mother blessed us and she had four kids. We have uh, two younger sisters, both girls. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it worked out. And the names, uh, names of some other siblings are Tom, Dick, and Sherry, and Michelle. Now, I know we're running a little late, so we have, a, we have to uh, cut out a little part of it we were going to do for you. But we have a very special guest we have to bring out before the, it's over. It's a, it's a gentleman that maybe you guys heard of. He's from the mystical state of Yo. It's a land of Yo. He's called the Yo-Yo Man. So if we get a little bit of music, I'll put my bass up. You know what? That's the music. And you, you know what? When that starts playing, this gentleman always seems to follow it. He's the fantastic, the one and only, let's hear it for the Yo-Yo Man, ladies and gentlemen. Yo-Yo Man. Hey, Yo-Yo Man, show everybody, show everybody your groovy look, you know, look really groovy. That's it. See how groovy he looks? You too can look that groovy if you utilize the Yo-Yo like he does. Show us some around the world, will you? Because around the world illustrates the philosophy of yo. Show us how we live our lives like the planet spinning around in the universe. We're always going somewhere. Always doing something. Let's see you do around the world backwards. Around the world backwards is very difficult because of the direction of the spinning mass. It fights the counter-rotation of the... What are you doing? 
That's around the world with a full twist. Oh, I get a little yo humor. Anybody have any favorite yo-yo tricks? We have time for two requests. Just holler them up. Just holler them up. Walk the baby in the cradle, walk the dog. You got it. Hey, yo-yo man, can you do rock the baby, walk the dog? Yeah, he says he can. Are we in luck or what? You get over there a little bit and show them rock that baby in the cradle. Overhand release puts the power to the spin, the build, the cradle. Baby gets rocked to sleep. And then back to the palm of the hand, the trick will be complete. Baby in the cradle, let's hear it for the yo-yo man, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, what? Can't hear you. Okay, let's do, here's a, here's a variation. Each and every yo-yo trick has countless ones. This is more, much more difficult, it's called, oh, yo-yo man, just a second, I'll tell you. You know what? Sometimes babies are born premature. You gotta put them in a little bitty cradle, keep them warm and safe. Now, I'm gonna see if you, can you rock the premature baby? and rock that baby in that little bitty cradle. Can you do it? Yeah, you can. Get up there. Give it a try. See, the state of yo is not a state of perfection. It's not perfection at all. It's the art of doing, not being afraid to stretch those boundaries. Now he's so far, so good. Now back to the palm of the hand. Two variations. Very same trick. Okay, yes for walk the dog, my personal favorite. Yo, yo, man, get over there. Show him a little full body yo. Can you do it? That looks like full body yo. Now walk that dog, spin it down. Whoa, that's all right, jumpy dogs. Okay, don't run him over. Do a little bit. Let's see how fast you can go with that dog. Look at that, walking that dog. Hey, yo-yo man, come over and do the yo-yo strut. Can you do the yo-yo strut? This is, this is a very, very groovy one. See how cool he's looking. Okay, yo-yo man, get over here. You look like the kind of guy that wants to uh, Take a trip to the mystic state of advanced yo. Is that true? Okay. These are the more difficult tricks, starting with the flying saucer. Flying saucer. Ooh. Ooh, how he spins it like that, I'll never know, but he could do it. Spins it flat. Okay, yo-yo man. Let's stay in outer space with shoot the moon. Thank you very much. Now, to shoot the moon, you got to be in a genuine state of yo. That means the yo must flow throughout your entire body. You can't fake it. You must feel groovy all over. Too groovy. Back down. Shoot the moon. Now remember I said it's not a state of perfection. That's right. Don't force it. When it feels right, you go with it. And that's how you learn. That's how you let it happen. Oh, he's got it. Let's hear it for you. Shoot the moon. What perfection. Absolutely perfect. What time? No. No, no. You can do it. Don't quit. Hey, all right. But, okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Now he's going to try a different trip that's very difficult for the old young man called the brain twister so watch carefully the brain twister can he do it overhand release puts the power to the spin he hooks it on and he spins it one two three back it up back to the palm of the hand can he do it Ooh, shoot the moon loop the loop hey oh but that's all right you were stretching for it let's see you do it again yo yo man that's okay you didn't do it it's got to come back to the palm of the hand right there's another thing, when you're in a state of yo, you try to fake it, but you can't fake it here. This is Boston. Back it up. Can he do it now? Shoot the moon, loop the loop. Yes, three tricks in one, all right! Yes. Thank you very much. And now it's time for the grand finale yo-yo trick, and this we proudly dedicate to the United States space program. It's called Blast Off because that yo-yo becomes a rocket. will blast off into outer space eventually to return for a soft landing in the yo-yo man's right front pocket. Dangerous and dramatic. Yes, indeed. Drum roll, please. Do we have a drum roll? There it is. Okay. The yo-yo man is pumping yo. Here he goes. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Blast off. Yes, he did it. The yo-yo man. Let's hear it, guys. Yo, yo, man. Okay. Thank you all very much. Here we got Tom and Ray. And you know what? We wish you the, another 10, 20, or 100 years doing this. One of the greatest shows and one of the greatest gifts that you give to this whole country. And you know, I, I'm th I don't We're think not I'm the alone. We're the original Molly Brothers. <laughs> They died in a train wreck. A they tragic. In, train an wreck. in a car wreck? <laughs> tragic car wreck. In 1969, a oh. plane crashed into their car. And on that plane was the Smothers was the Brothers. Smothers, the original Smothers. The original ones. <laughs> We're not going to do two verses of this song because we're out of time. Yeah. Okay.
We think you're going to hear this song, understand if you want to sing along, you just join. Let me tell you a story about a man named Charlie on a tragic and fateful day. He put ten cents in his pocket, kissed his wife and family, and went out on the MTA. Okay. Well, did he ever return? No, he never returned. And his fate is still on Poor old Charlie. He may ride forever in the streets of Boston. He's a man who never returned. Well, you citizens of Boston, don't you think it's a scandal that the people have to pay? Stop the music! Stop the music! I'm surrounded by assassins! <laughs> Fight the fair increase of the George O'Brien, Charlie of the MTA. Oh, did he ever return? No, oh, he never returned. And his fate is still unlearned. He may ride forever beneath the streets of Boston. He's a man who never returned. He's a man who never returned. He's a man who never returned. The Joyce Brothers, the Flying Cow Marshall Brothers, the Brothers in Blue, the MFA Cheerleaders, Northern Lights. Did I leave anyone out? Dr. Dr. Joyce Brothers, John Bugsy Lawler. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, guys. Let's hit the road. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. It was great. Thank, Thank you very much. Really good. Thanks. <laughs>